Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today we have a wonderful guest by the name of Michael Simon. Now, he has earned a himself as a renowned interior decorator, furniture creator, collector, and I'm going to say this word, and Michael, if I say it wrong, um, please correct me, and it's called an antiquaire, is that it? Antiquaire. And, you know, you're such a rare talent because you spent your formative years training to become a music composer, and, and now you've kind of moved on to doing interior designer work, but it's both of them are quite an art. So I, I want to talk all about the art form, the, the sense of being able to do two things, which really are very interesting things. So let's just introduce you again. And your name is Michael Simon. And Michael, uh, let the audience know a little bit more about you. So start off by telling our audience what made you change your career from being a an, uh, an artist, a musician, to becoming an interior designer? Well, uh, Susan, it was frankly a matter of practicality. I had, um, as, a, as a youngster at a quite young age, I was interested in um, writing music and for something probably for the theater, possibly going toward the opera. And as a youth... And I'm talking about it at a really young age. I started playing the piano at three hmm. and then writing at four or five. But I always had two deep interests, and one was the music and the other was art of sorts, and particularly having to do with the theater. And um, when I would come home from school, for example, as a youngster, I would sit at the piano for several hours from 3 o'clock until 6. And my mother would say, all right, no more playing. Your father's home and we'll have dinner. <laughs> and after dinner, I would go upstairs and I would paint. And I would often um, paint sort of scenic backdrops, if you will. Mm -hmm. So there, so there was a deep interest in both of these things. And um, I... Uh, it was really an escape for me, if you will. Uh, I spent a lot of time in these pursuits. Hold on, and, a minute, Michael. I want to ask yeah. you: when you say it was a pursuit, and it was, and it was when you were so young. Now, why? Um, you know, do, first of all, the first question I would have um, about that is: do you think you were born with this ability to do all this? this music and and this art and various other things at a very early age? Because it's not very often that people tell me that they began doing this so so young. I, I, I believe in old souls, if you will, and I think that there that there are fresh souls and there are old souls and, and I am I'm an old soul and I typically I, I generally can spot one when I see one. And they, and what is my definition of that? That you come into this life and you're carrying something with you from a previous existence. Uh -huh. And um, and why I feel fairly secure about that is that from a very early age, my interests in music um, were definite and had. Um, nothing to do with what I had been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true of my interest in um, design. And so, for example, both uh, France and Russia uh, have always played very, very uh, leading roles in my history mm -hmm. in terms of the music that I like and, and, and in the music. That, and I like all kinds of music, but I would say particularly that music that traverses the late 19th century into the first quarter of the 20th century in both Russia and France mm -hmm. just moves me in a way that none other can. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, on the design side, particularly having to do with furniture, uh, decorative arts, and architecture, it's 18th century France and late 18th century Russia. So you, they're... they're mm -hmm. Go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. No, so, so they are um, extremely strong uh, poles 
uh, in my life that 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 have been with me since th- my earliest memory and to 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 this moment now. Mm-hmm. You alluded, Michael, to the fact that something in your personality or in your attitude um, was really hoping and and trying to uh, do something that would change your life in certain ways. Um, was there, I mean, this is a very personal question, but was there something going on in your life um, when you were young that kind of pushed you to try to transform you in ways you couldn't even describe? Well, I had a, I, it's a, it's a good question, Susan. And um, like so many children, uh, I was a pretty unhappy child. And I didn't really fit any particular mold that in suburban Philadelphia, a, a child mm-hmm. 60 plus years ago would, uh, you know, would have fit. And so I spent a lot of time escaping. Um, uh-huh. And 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 I, <laughs> in some ways, I could call myself a Houdini because I I found and I was very blessed in this regard to find a safe space if you will where i you know felt good and so it was a it was a place that i really enjoyed um retreating into if you will mm-hmm. and and it was um, a good place I, michael right i mean cuz it was a no it was a wonderful place yeah and i and and i have from the earliest age i mean i had very very specific interests and i have often thought what a blessing it is to have an idea of what you want to do in your life, what you want to pursue, mm-hmm. because I think there are many people uh, who haven't any idea, and I'm sure that when they get out of you know, a certain level of education, if they're lucky enough to go to a college or a university and they've got to start figuring out what they want to do, mm-hmm. um, that could be daunting, it could be challenging, And it could be trial and error until they actually find something that feels like it fits. You know, I'm going to tell you a a small, uh, well, a short story. Um, Many years ago, I attended a program in Gainesville, Florida, at the University of Florida, called the Arts and Medicine Program. And this program provided you with uh, the idea that people when when they are introduced to the arts and when they're dealing with all kinds of physical and mental and various other issues, um, somehow when you introduce them to music and when you introduce them to all kinds of arts, you know, painting and performing arts and various other things, again, it transforms them in ways they can't even describe. It takes them away from their illness. It distracts them. It puts them in a good place. Um, so, you know, my my ish, my question, I suppose, to you is, you found something. Now, I want you to tell our audience um, how, if they're not as talented as you are, can they still do things in the arts that would give them the opportunity to feel the way you do? That it's such an astute question. Um, first of all, I do believe that the arts are transportative and that um, I spend a lot of my time in the ether if if that makes any sense mm-hmm. meaning that it's not sort of in the uh, I guess the race mind of the day-to-day problems that each one of us deals with mm-hmm. and I think and I and I give a talk um, about how my how my formal education as a musician, as a composer, um, informs my work as a designer. And I talk about, um, in music, that there is real time and psychological time. Mm -hmm. And in design, there is physical space and there's psychological space. And what that means, in, in my view, is that the clock is ticking, for example, in music. But once you, you know, get on the horse, so to speak, once you're part of the journey, time as we know it is suspended and we are, we are moved and we're transported to another, to another place. And the same thing happens physically if the environment is, um, 
unique enough and intimate enough and special enough that it can do that. And so I think that yes, music is um is is a remarkable bomb as all of the arts are and I think it doesn't matter at all whether you have a talent to create or play if you have a talent to listen to it and an openness mm-hmm. to be transported and I think that's that's the important part is that you need to um be open to that to sort of let go and let it wash over you and immerse yourself in it because it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Yeah. You know, there are lots of movies out today uh, that show that kids, and I'm talking about all age, all ages of um, uh, kids who, when they're, again, when they have a class in music or they, they can paint a uh, class painting, it changes their attitude. Uh, kids are so, I mean, today... The kids love, they love songs that are rap, hip-hop, and things of that nature. Now, I have to admit that it's not my favorite music, but isn't that something... Nor is it, mo- nor is it mine. Yes, no. and, okay, but but don't you think that just even, um, even if we don't particularly like it, you and I, for them, it's an opportunity to kind of deal with their problems because kids really seem to... They seem to be very excited to be able to to sing rap or to be participating in in hip hop. So um, I'm just thinking uh, again about how music and all these things um, even take kids to another place where they can kind of function better. Do, do you agree? Well, with me? I, I I do agree, and I think that um, all of the arts, and I would include cuisine, I would include journalism, um, I would include politics, I guess it's an art of a certain kind, but aren't they in fact um, and haven't they always been a reaction to the time that we're living in? If you if you if you look back in history, for example, uh, and it and I like to give uh, to give this as an example, if you look at the impressionist period and you see what's going on in music, what's going on in art, what's going on in dance, what's going on in poetry, what's going on in architecture, uh, literature. It's all the same breath. It's all the same heartbeat in history. And we don't recognize it at the moment that we're in it, but we're always evolving and we're always changing, and each generation has to find their own voice and has to define their own space and I think that's how it happens and it doesn't and and it happens nowadays much more quickly than it used to because information travels at a speed that it never did really I mean the last 20 years I suspect it's it's changed wildly right now there are uh, plenty of different places where you've done your designs. Um, in fact, some of the oldest houses in um, in Manhattan, and you were involved in the Mount, which is in Lenox, Massachusetts. In fact, it's a very interesting thing, Michael, because I've interviewed the director of the Edith Wharton Estate, and um, what a beautiful and a magnificent place that is. Now, is there a place, a particular place, if you had your choice, that you can kind of design? Um, today, a lot of designers are doing really wild things. Um, has your kind of your attitude toward designing changed? Is it is it more modern? Is is it just very different than you described before? When I when I started out as a designer, I came to it at a fairly mature age. And it was, as I as I said earlier, a matter of practicality. I simply I had to have a day job um, to support my music career, and it was isolating. And um, I and and because my interests were fairly esoteric, um, I could see that it was going to be very hard to make a living. Right. And I was respected, and I was known um, in the in the industry. But um, it, it, the, the, right, the handwriting was on the wall. Mm-hmm. And um, 
I so I had always had this very deep interest in architecture and the decorative arts, but I thought that I was already too old to go back to school and to um, get a degree, <laughs> excuse me, in architecture. So I knew that I had to do something that would differentiate uh, my business and my skills from the the uh, many, many talented people mm-hmm. who were in this industry. And because I had that significant interest in the 18th century and in France particularly, I thought, well, I'm going to I'm going to immerse myself in that and I'm going to learn everything that I possibly can. Mm-hmm. And I did, and I and I amassed a library that uh, is is very very large and I studied textiles and everything that you can imagine related mm. to it. That's and because fun. I never well, it was I was passionate about it and if a person has a passion he or she can learn absolutely anything i'm convinced right and um so and i never worked for another designer and how i you know how i started the business is is a bit of a circuitous story but uh, but i'll 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 sort of go to the very end of it okay um, sure there was i i had i had worked for many many years for citibank and I uh, was in the um, strategic planning department, which was part of marketing. And I was uh, I came in actually as a word processing temporary. Mm-hmm. This was how I partially supported myself for my music career. But as time went on, I got to know a lot of the people there, and we had conversations, and and and, and I ended up being their director of branch design for the tri-state area. And can, I, can I stop you for a second? Because I'm going to tell sure. I'm going to tell you a little story. Many yeah. many years ago, I used to uh, shoot industrial videos, mm-hmm. and uh, Citibank um, they um, decided that they wanted me to do a, a special program for them. So oh, what they wanted us to do is they wanted us to create like a um, uh, a kind of ball, a magical ball where th- you would see smoke come out of it. So, uh, you know, I researched it and I put it together and we lit the um, the special kind of chemicals to make that kind of interesting um, <laughs> interesting little project. Well, guess what we did? We set off all the alarms in Citibank. <laughs> all the fire alarms <laughs> and and everybody was starting to run out of the building so you know when you talked about Citibank it just made me think about that particular thing but this has nothing to do with you Michael um, and, no, and but your it's journey a nice, it's, a, it's a nice story <laughs> um, well anyway so at the point that I I, I had been working on march- merchandising and the bank at a, at, a, at a moment when I was there started talking about morphing Citibank um, into more of a retail experience for their customers so that it wasn't chore-driven the way going to the post office might be. And that kind of piqued my um, imagination, and I went to the director of marketing, and I said, you know, everybody on this floor, except for me, um, is an MBA, and I'm not sure that anybody on this floor really understands viscerally what a customer might experience mm-hmm. in a branch that would to, to really make it a retail experience. Yeah. And I basically sold myself to him, and he said, all right, well, let's try it on a probationary period. So it happens that the um, great textile manufacturer, Scalamandre, uh, had at this time their um, their mill where they manufactured remarkable textiles mm-hmm. um, for the home industry and for the hospitality industry. Mm-hmm. And because they were a, a stone's throw from the City Corp building in Long Island City that had opened that I was working in, mm-hmm. I contacted them and I said I'm looking to develop a program to brand our bank branches and um, would you be interested in working with me to develop textiles and wall coverings and carpets and things like that and they were interested so 
I got to know the family that was the, the original owners of this from mm-hmm. um, from the 20, early 20th century. And as we got to know one another and enjoyed each other's company, they introduced me to their archives. And in their archives, they had documents, and a document is a sample of a fabric, mm-hmm. essentially, that dated back as far as the 17th century. And uh, they had a, a good collection of 18th century and a remarkable collection of the 19th century. Mm-hmm. And Scala Mandre uh, was very well known for historic restoration. And, um, you know, they they made textiles for the White House, for example, and right. many, many museums over the years. So I immersed myself in their archive and really loved it. And then about, um, I don't know, a couple of years had passed perhaps, and mm-hmm. they decided that they were going to move their New York City showroom from its location on the 10th floor of a building on 3rd Avenue and 57th Street to a five-story townhouse that was on 3rd Avenue between 57th and 56th. And the family got together. There were five family members, and they decided that they would do this, and each one of them submitted five names of designers that Mm -hmm. they thought could help them do do the place. My name was the only name that was on everybody's list, and the reason that they had me was that they knew that I could run a commercial job because of Citibank, but they also knew that I had this very deep interest in their archives and the history. So they approached me about helping them, and I and I did so. Yes. And uh, and but the but one of the stipulations um, from my side was that I would do their window displays for their opening gala, Mm -hmm. and that uh, they would weave whatever I wanted in terms of textiles, pasmantry, which is trimmings, fringes, things like that, Mm. and carpets, and that they would fund whatever else I wanted to do for the backgrounds and ensuring things that I might borrow to put in the window. And this window was not that big, but it was big enough that I could make a statement and so what I did was ask, I, I went into their archives, found um, a, a textile that is called a Lampa, L-A-M-P-A-S. Some mm-hmm. people call it a Lampus. And, um, and, 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 it, and I had them weave it as if it had oxidized over a period of 200 some odd years wow. so that it would actually look as if it had dated from the 18th century. And we did the same thing with the rest of the textiles and the trims. And I designed a boiserie, a panel, paneled space, and borrowed uh, quite extraordinary pieces of furniture for this tiny window uh, from some of the very better dealers. And and they really didn't know much of what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. But you know, the night of the gala, I, I, I un, you know, took the brown paper off the windows and so forth and they were very delighted with it and they left it up for eight months oh wonderful and that's how the business began and And so so people even today think of me as someone who was adept is adept at doing interiors that really reflect the 18th century so you know what you're telling me in a sense is that you're a celebrity and you know it's a very interesting thing to me because um Today, um, if it's architects, if it's chefs, um, people who um, sometimes it's oh I don't know it's even doctors, they may, they they kind of develop a reputation for being you know absolutely marvelous, absolutely great, knowing you know how to make things very different and very interesting, and so they're and now they've become celebrities. Do you feel like you're a celebrity? Well, no, not at all. And 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 to rewind for a moment and and to um, to get back to your question, um, because you 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 started off by asking me about you know do I enjoy doing things that are modern and so forth and so mm-hmm. on. Right. There is a very 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 tiny market at this point for. Um, anything that is backward looking or at least that 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 is, goes farther back than mid century modern meaning twentieth right. century so 
um, as it, it happens that one of <coughs> excuse me one of my beloved clients um, for whom we did something that was in a Gustavian taste these are um, an American family in Minneapolis whose mm-hmm. forebears came from Sweden right. we did that and um, they wanted to do another project and that was in Arizona and so we looked at some houses together and the one that there was only one that appealed to me and it was high 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 up on a mountain it was the smallest of the five or six that we looked at but it had the ability to be transformed into something completely different and 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 what it could be transformed into would be something modern and i really wanted to do something that was modern, mm-hmm. but the nature of my work, because it is my, my work manifests itself as my music did, it is composed, mm-hmm. and that means that each of the elements, whether they are carpets or textiles or furniture or you know even in some cases art, mm-hmm. everything is made to order custom for these projects, and the um the, the, that that methodology is actually not so different from what the English architect Robert Adam did in the 18th century in England because he was designing the doorknobs and the architecture and the carpets and the plaster ceilings and the textiles and so forth and so mm-hmm. on. So you are entering a universe and it is unique and hopefully it is a terrific reflection of the homeowners. Mm -hmm. So when I started this particular project, I did it with some trepidation because, A, um, I had been working in a traditional medium for a very, very long time. And I I had some doubts about my ability to actually pull it off. Mm -hmm. But I found, in fact, after, you know, the ball started rolling, that I preferred it to doing the quote unquote period work because I was in control of absolutely everything now. Oh, how great is that? It, it it is great and it's wonderful if you have a client who is trusting enough and wants to take that journey which these people were and did um to to unleash that creativity and create something that is, you know, quiet and intimate, but very, very special, mm-hmm. and and theirs alone. Yes. So I really loved it. Mm-hmm. So um, my last point is that um, I want to know whether you think things are going to turn around. Um, you, you again, you alluded to the fact that people today are not particularly interested in antiques and you know all the different kinds of work that existed about 100 years ago. Um, in fact, I'm just going to um, add something to that, and that is that I I was very fortunate to um, inherit from my father-in-law many, many antiques, beautiful antiques, worth, I thought, a lot of money. But uh, mm-hmm. when I showed it to an antiques dealer, they said, sorry, people today are not interested, young people today are not interested in all these antiques. They want to just go into some of these modern stores and just you know do their um their work in their house using just simple things very simple things so do you think things are going to turn around because that stuff is the 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 craftsmanship and the beauty and and but unfortunately the expense of it is is probably prohibitive but do you think it's going to turn around it's a great question and it is the it's the question that so many of my colleagues uh, and I contemplate all the time. The, the, I, I actually do not think it's going to turn around, meaning uh, that I, I don't think in the same way that uh, make America great again, mm-hmm. uh, we're not going back 50 years. And, and the same thing is true in, um, you know, in, in um, the home furnishings business and so many other businesses. It's not necessarily a bad thing because mm-hmm. change can be good, but I think that, again, it has to do with the speed that information travels at. It has to do with the fact that families, you know, when when antiques were handed down from one generation to another, mm-hmm. it had 
apart apart from the decorative value of it and the craftsmanship value of it i think that there was um there was a, a, a value that this was something that had meaning in your family mm-hmm. and your ancestors lives and i think that with you know, each ensuing generation is more mobile mm-hmm. and they're not tied down and everything becomes more and more global and I, in fact, I was just reading an article in the Times last week in the design section about a couple of young guys that have um, started a furniture line. They make sofas, oh. and they come apart, and they're shipped in five boxes via FedEx. So oh. you don't have to hire a mover to take it up your five-story townhouse oh, in boy. Manhattan if you're a young person you know, moving yeah, right. here or wherever. And I think that that's the way they're thinking. I think mm-hmm. technology is all important. And I also think that virtual realities will affect very much the way people live. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, why invest all that money if you can put a headset on and be transported anywhere in the world backwards or forward? Absolutely. Uh, it is, you know, it's, and there's no use crying about it because change is inevitable. And and something good will come out of that. I right. I, I truly believe it. Um, you know, will I be will I be on the forefront of that? Absolutely not. <laughs> but <laughs> right. but on the other hand, when somebody you know wants something, um, you know that very few people can produce. I will be one of the go-to people. That's fantastic. Well, my guest today has been Michael Simon. Um, and if you listen to the way he is passionate about what he does, you'll realize that you're dealing with somebody who is really very special. He's a rare talent. And I want to thank you so very much. Now, Michael, if people want to read anything that you've wrote, written or they want to go to your website and learn a little bit about you, would you give them some of the information that they need? Oh, absolutely. The uh, website is Michael Simon Inc. I N C dot com, and uh, lots of things will come up. If Good you, enough. If you That's go there. great. Well, again, um, I want to thank Michael Simon for being on the Susan Brenda Show. It was just very enlightening and very interesting. So, thank you again, Michael. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.